Okay, so should we kick off then, Diane? Thank you for recording. Um, so uh, my name is Jackie Elliott. I'm a consultant here in Sheffield and um, I lead the diabetes service here. Um, do a lot with uh, the young person service and also technology. And this group fed out of the uh, Yorkshire and Humber technology group. Um, so we're trying to make the newer technologies as green as we can. Okay, so Diane, if you want to introduce yourself uh, and then Amanda. Yep, so Diane Robinson, I'm a clinical projects manager with NHS England physical health and prevention team, but I work on diabetes um, in the adults. Thank you. Yeah. Hi everyone, I'm Amanda Lily Kelly. I'm a project manager from Health Innovation Yorkshire and Humber, which used to be known as the Yorkshire and Humber AHSN Academic Health Science Network. Uh, project manager there, been focusing on net zero and environmental sustainability for 18 months now, um, supporting different projects uh, across the hum um, Yorkshire and Humber footprint. So that's Humber, North Yorks, West Yorks and South Yorks. So yeah, lovely to meet you all. Great, thank you, Amanda. I'm really pleased that you can uh, join us and help push this forward. Darren? Hi, <coughs> I'm the Senior Sustainability Manager with NHS England to manage the, the Greener team. You've probably met Hawaran before um, and um, with NHS reorganisations, I used to manage the uh, Clinical Network for Mental Health in North East North Cumbria, um, but uh, I've moved in to lead this team and Hawaran's now on secondment to uh, the Midlands Greener team. Great, thank you. Welcome. Richard? Morning, everybody. I'm Richard Danishevsky and I'm Joint Clinical Lead for Diabetes Prevention, Treatment and Care at NHS South Yorkshire ICB. I do that one day a week. I'm also a lead clinical pharmacist in Barnsley Primary Care Network. Thank you. And Haroon. Hi, everyone. I'm Haroon Taylor and the CTO of UMaker and uh, co-created the Medicines Carbon Footprint Classifier, which we've been working hard on and I'm going to give you a presentation about today. Great, thank you. So um, I thought I'd ask you to introduce yourself last because you're kicking into the, the next bit. So please just tell us all about you makers. Um, I, I know nothing, so. Uh... <laughs> that's, um, that's good. Uh, let me just share my screen. Can everyone see that? Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so yeah. I'm Poon Taylor. I'm going to give you an overview of motivation, methods, and uses of the MCF classifier, and then leave plenty of time at the end for questions. Uh, firstly, I just want to give some background on UMaker itself. UMaker was founded by Nazneen Rahman in 2020 as a purpose driven company building science based solutions for people, planet, and prosperity. We do this in three main ways, um, drive culture through partnerships, drive change and through products to drive action. And a bit about myself, I'm a computational biologist by background. Uh, my main drive throughout my career has been building systematic, understandable data solutions in healthcare. I joined UMaker about, I think it's a bit over two years ago now. Uh, to bring this experience to creating sustainable and environmentally effective health tech solutions. So the MCF classifier, um, Medicine Carbon Footprint Classifier, is a suite of data applications that allow you to measure, classify, benchmark and visualise carbon emissions of small molecule medicines. And I'll provide an overview in the slides, but also if you're interested, please do read the paper. Um, I can share the link as well. Um, is it? Um, so why do we decide to focus our efforts on medicines? And it was really this picture and the information behind it on the carbon footprint. I'm sure some people have seen this before. Um, and that shows that a quarter of the NHS footprint is in medicines. And then on the left hand side for anaesthetics and inhalers, we now have product level information that's allowed us to drive forward changes such as stopping the use of desferane, or moving from metered dose to dry powder inhalers. However, for this, the rest of this 20%, we still don't have granular information to drive forward the necessary action. 
Uh, and this slide shows the different approaches that have been implemented to estimate carbon emissions so far. There's been like two angles of attack. Uh, right hand side to have top down approach, which is how the majority of that NHS total footprint was estimated. Um, this is done using a method called environmentally extended input output modeling where at the most basic level you can think of it as taking your expenditure and multiplying it by an economic factor to estimate your footprint. This is very useful for giving an estimate of emissions to pair when comparing different sectors or in uh, of industry or different industries. However, if you want to drill down further, um, it lacks like the accuracy to be able to do that, especially in an um, especially with medicines where there are so many uh, economic variables which don't directly affect the emissions. And then on the other side here we have the bottom up methods, which is typically a life cycle assessment. These involve a combination of measurements and estimates for each stage in the life cycle of a single product, which are then added together to give an estimate of the product footprint. So this brings a high level of accuracy, granularity, but it lacks the scalability. And these LCAs are very useful for getting emissions for a single product or identifying product hotspots within a single company, but we're still a significant time away from being able to expand those to compare across different products or different companies or indeed across a whole sector to have like a standardized framework for performing the LCAs. So our aim with MCF classifier was to have something that had enough scalability and accuracy to make robust comparisons and prioritizations between medicines. Um, and our efforts were focused on creating an estimate of the carbon footprint for the active pharmaceutical manufacturer of small molecule medicines. Why small molecule medicines? Because these cover around 90% of medicines and we could create a systematic data solution to calculate or estimate the footprint for small molecules and also why API manufacturing because this is typically the single biggest contributor to, to the carbon footprint of a small molecule medicine. Uh, and again, the details of the MCF method can be found in the paper, but some of the key takeaways. Uh, number one is that we're not reinventing the wheel. We wanted to use existing well used and researched green chemistry metrics. Uh, the first one being process mass intensity, which gives you the amount of input materials used to produce one kilogram of the active pharmaceutical ingredient. And the second is global warming potential, which is a key green chemistry metric across many sectors, and that gives the carbon dioxide equivalents generated to produce one kilogram of, in this case, the API. And you can see here from the right hand side that those two metrics are very highly co correlated. So pre by predicting the process mass intensity, you have a good prediction of what the global warming potential will be as well. And secondly, we created a systematic process. This gives a sort of overview diagram of the process steps. Um, the important thing here is that it's the same process for every single medicine. So that um, when we're making comparisons between medicines and we have two different MCF ratings, we can feel confident that that's a reasonable comparison to make. And thirdly, wherever possible, we try to compare the MCF method with existing estimates and found it to be in line with them. So here, for the global warming potential values, we compared it to the ABPI blister pack carbon footprint tool and the implied distributions of both our method and their method are very similar. And we also compared the uh, grams of CO2 equivalents per dose with manufacturer data where it was available, although this is quite limited. And so once we'd formalized that MCF method, we want and calculated the per dose carbon footprint values. We wanted to categorize these into easily digestible MCF ratings. Um, the important thing here is that it's a logarithmic scale, which means that a low MCF medicine has a 10 times lower carbon footprint than an average medium medicine, which has a 10 times lower carbon footprint than an average high medicine. And 
this, the reason we chose this is the logarithmic scale gave a more even distribution of medicines across the low, medium, high categories compared to a linear scale. And also it makes the ratings more robust to underlying uncertainty in the numbers. So if the raw values, the uncertainty in the raw values change a little bit, typically the categories of those MCF ratings don't change as much. And then from these ratings, we created the MCF formery, which is an educational tool to explore MCF ratings across thousands of medicines. And it's now live and freely available to use at formery.umaker.com. And I'm going to risk giving you a live demo of it. Uh, so yeah, here's the front page of the MCF formery. It allows you to start typing and search for a medicine and see this the carbon footprints of the um, medicine products. And it's uh, set up similarly to the British National Formary. So you're searching for the um, British National Formary like chemical substance here. Um, what's a good method? If we search for a medicine, so you can initiate the search clicking this button, and then it will give you the most prescribed product for the medicine that you search is always the first result. And then it, as in the British National Formary, it shows you the similar medicines and the most prescribed product for each one of those medicines from most to least prescribed. And this is based on 2023 prescription data in primary care. And then for any of these medicines, you can click these drop down arrows to see the other products again from most to least prescribed. Uh, it's important to note here that the so the, these Product ratings are dose specific. So you hit, see here, this is the same medicine, it has the same active pharmaceutical ingredient, but because this is five milligrams and there's less of the active pharmaceutical ingredient in the medicine product, this has a low MCF rating, whereas this would have a medium MCF rating. Uh, and then, yeah, we also have some educational tools. You can read about MCF formery, um, some FAQs, which includes the um, uh, the logarithmic scale that I detailed earlier uh, and then yeah please do contact us if you have anything and yeah please go ahead and use it you just have to it's very easy to sign up you just need to give your email and then you can start using the formery um, and yeah the one of the other use cases that we've been investigating and we investigated a bit more in the paper was uh, landscaping medicine carbon footprints so this is a slightly different set to what's in the MCF formery but here's the selection criteria and we took 2,214 products for which we could calculate ratings uh, from products prescribed in primary care in England in January 2023. And this represented 2.2 billion doses. And this is just, and yeah, we used these selection criteria to make it easier to do the, like systematic analysis. Um, and what we found there was that um, one, medicines have a lot of emissions. And uh, to 25% of the products with the highest MCF ratings accounted for 75% of the emission, emissions. So this sort of um, leads you towards selecting like meds and hotspots that we can sort of use like something that can be the next inhaler thing that can drive towards. And one of the biggest contributors to this was antibiotics. So actually 15% of the carbon emissions in uh, primary care in January 2023 were due to penicillins. And that's roughly equivalent to monthly emissions of 140,000 cars. And of that 15%, 50% of that was attributable to amoxicillin. So we thought that this offers a really practical triple win in the area of like antimicrobial stewardship, where changes can be clinically cost and carbon effective. So this is just based on the national medicines optimization opportunities from 2023-24, recommending that 75% of amoxicillin should be five-day courses. And this is a typical ICB is actually at 49% at the moment. And this is just the difference and quantifying if they were at 75%. So this show, um, shows like the savings that an ICB can make and just sort of gives an idea of the sort of things that the MCF method can be used to like quantify different strategies and what their carbon savings might be. And yeah, this savings equivalent to 16,000 meter dose inhalers to dry powder inhalers. Um, yeah, thanks. And yeah, are there any questions? 
thank you, Haroon. Um, I'd like to just let the other people that weren't at the beginning that, but I told you they would join because they always do join, just introduce themselves <laughs> so that you know who might be firing uh, questions at you. So Hannah, Claire, Chris, and then Kavitha, can you just introduce yourselves, please? Hi, Haroon. Um, I'm Hannah Bieber, consultant pharmacist for diabetes. Nice to meet you. Hi, I'm Chris Ranson. I'm a senior medicines management pharmacist for Humber, North Yorkshire, ICB. Hi, I'm Claire Thompson. I'm a primary care development nurse in Sheffield, and I am so sorry about being on and off and missing most of your presentation. So I'd be really grateful if you could send me the slides because I missed it completely because there are IT problems. So I'm so sorry. Uh, no we have recorded and I think we've all had IT problems with Teams this week. It's been particularly bad. So we waited till five past and then we have recorded it. So you've only got 15 minutes to uh, catch up on. And Kavitha? Hi everyone, I'm Kavitha Saitamadavan. I'm the Net Zero Programme Manager for Northeastern Yorkshire. Great, thank you. So Kavitha, you had your hand up first. So have you got a question for I think Haroon? it was Richard. Richard? No? OK. Uh, my question, first of all, a really helpful presentation. Thank you. Mm. Um, two questions, really. Um, I don't know much about it, but I'm going to ask the question anyway. Uh, so the MCF classifier, is it is it mostly based on, I think I saw the word logarithms in it. So is that kind of a calculation that you use mostly to uh, classify the drugs? That's my first question. And the second question is, where we can identify in the formulary that a particular drug has got a really high carbon footprint, will it then offer the prescriber um, the choices they've got in terms of choosing a less carbon intensive drug for the same condition? Um, yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, so firstly, so for so for calculating the raw value ratings themselves, it uses the cask it uses a machine learning model which basically incorporates the the weight of the active pharmaceutical ingredient and the complexity of it so how much it takes to make it and then it estimates the um, global warming potential from those two characteristics so that's how we can have like a systematic solution that goes through thousands of medicines and calculates something in exactly the same way it's not as ac it, I wouldn't say it's as accurate as a life cycle analysis, but it's more practical because a life cycle analysis for one product costs lots of money and takes like six months. The logarithmic part of that is then to convert those those raw values into ratings, which you can see. So you can see what is low, medium, and high. So that's where the logarithmic part comes in. Um, that was the and then um, for the second question, yes. So we worked closely with Greener NHS when we were developing this and we want to be really careful about presenting um, like clinical recommendation information. So the MCF formary is specifically an educational tool and then it's for what the teams or the um, like the healthcare professionals to then go away and use that in tandem. So at the moment it's not integrated anywhere for them to use it but like if you, you can start to look at those MCF ratings and see OK, here in this area, I have this option between these two things. That's pretty similar, but that's not for me to say. That is for the healthcare professionals, I would say. So that's where okay. at the moment it's really an educational tool for you to go and look and start to um, think about or for people to start to think about um, carbon footprinting of medicines. And sorry, I just got a, a follow up question. Um, are you then planning to, I, I appreciate it's an educational piece and um, are you looking to get it um, acknowledged, recognised, endorsed by any of the professional bodies? Um, I don't know, <laughs> to be <laughs> honest. I'm not sure. I, so it, this version of it is very built, so it's funded through the Small Business Research Initiative. Um, in, so it's very set, so it's set up so that it feels familiar to anyone who uses the BNF regularly. This ver like this window of it. So like if there is scope or one or funding to integrate it into those systems, we've set it up to make that as easy as possible. But I'm not sure I, what we what the next step of it is. Thank you. Thank you. 
Chris. So, uh, um, thank you for, for the presentation. I, I can envisage, I mean, a lot of our ICVs, certainly uh, we have aired prescribing committees and a lot of our new product request forms now have an element around sustainability around the products that's been requested. And the, the issue is that we tend to find it quite difficult to get information in regards to that. So this will be really useful. And actually, I'm now thinking I would want to have this on the the form with the link so people can go to it to um access that information i think that'd be really useful um my question is is how often is it going to get updated thinking moving forward if i get new product request how quickly is that information likely to be put onto this uh, uh um forum um yeah at the moment it's going to be updated the mcf form is going to be updated once a year and probably around the uh, Mar March, April time every year, um, because then it will be relevant for the previous year, if that makes sense, because it's normally this information is normally backdated about three, three months. Um, in terms of with new product requests, we can actually like calculate the information using the pipeline, given like a minimum amount of information. If you have the active pharmaceutical ingredient, the dose and the form of the of the medicine so it, it it can be used to calculate those things but i think that's more like specific requests rather than the mcf form itself and just a, a follow on from that and just thinking because i found it really useful around the amoxicillin and certainly that is something that for a lot of areas are doing at the moment around get moving to five days is there a way of using it to actually calculate what your overall carbon footprint of amoxicillin is at the moment and therefore you can then use that data to, to demonstrate actually this is what the impact's actually going to be within our icb uh yes um but we haven't we, we're working with people to potentially pilot that or see if there's funding in that area i think so the national that they had a five-year course uh, from 2019 to 2024 where they wanted to to get everyone to the 75 percent target but the average is actually 49 percent so this just adds an extra layer of you are also saving that carbon as well as reducing these yeah. sorts of things and there is definitely yes we have the the, the information for secondary care as well but may especially for primary care at like as granular of gp level you can quantify like okay if you did this you would save this amount or this is your current carbon footprint for amoxicillin based on like yeah for yeah and then scaling that up to icb level or any any level great thank you excellent thank you richard thanks jackie uh thank you harun it looks a really great looks it looks a really great resource and to me it looks like something that could be really beneficial used at the icb level to to identify um some really important factors but for it to be implemented in primary care i think you hit the nail on the head when you mention integration because for this to be part of business as usual it it really needs to be integrated into the clinical systems um it gives an element of additional clunkiness, having your system separate from the clinical systems. Um, but I do think it's really good. I can see a place for it at ICB level where we're, we're trying to identify, let's say the top 10 um, high carbon footprint, footprint drugs or um, whatever uh, intervention, and then for that to be used centrally to drive some of the uh, initiatives forward. Thank you, Haroon. Hannah? Yeah, I agree. I think that it, it would be nice if it synced with what we were already using, but I think it is really good and I think that it will be used in that way, exactly what we're saying, and especially because it's written like the BNF per BNF category. That's really, really helpful because that means that when we've got sort of specialist teams looking within an area, it just makes our lives an awful lot an awful lot easier so that's 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 great wonderful resource thank you so Haroon I'm um, check. I've just gone to the website I can't see how to search for a particular drug um so, on do the you, do you Formula need a website. Subscri you, well, you can you can try and search for one and then you have to create an account based on well that's it I can't see where to even search just for one drug so I need yeah, an account. You have first. to be registered. 
Right. OK, that was just something to clarify, because what I wanted to know, because you, you talked about small molecules, do, is insulin included in there? Is that a small molecule? Um, I don't. Is insulin included? I'm not sure. Um, but so insulin is one of those cases where insulin has a high carbon footprint. Mm. But if you're on insulin, you can't really do much about it. So I think this is where like we you have to be careful about the choices. So what like the integration into clinical systems comes after you've done that piece that um, Richard was saying, like where you identify the hotspots and then like have more discussions about it. So, for example, with the amoxicillin, when you're reducing to seven to five day, you're just reducing the number of tablets. So you're obviously going to have a saving because you're just prescribing less of it. And it's quite a sort of like safe hit. If you're making mm. choices between different medicines, this is something that we've not really seen yet, making choices based on specifically carbon. So that's where we're trying to use the landscaping to identify like where's a triple win, where we can have like something that is clinically better or equivalent cost mm. saving and carbon saving. And because this is a new information, there are those triple wins out there. We just need to mm. find them mm. essentially. Yeah, um, but so, I, th I think insulin is something where that whilst it does have a high carbon footprint, there's not a low carbon footprint and alternative to insulin. Well, I, you would know better than me, but I don't think there is. Well, potentially there might be. So this is what we need to know. Oh, okay. So, okay, so you know the landscape is changing, and it it might be that um, insulin is a lot higher carbon footprint than say the GLP one analogs as a class, and I don't know the answer to that. So I think it would help inform discussions, but because insulin is such a common drug, it's not as common as amoxicillin, um, I think there would be room to manoeuvre between different uh, insulins. If we had that kind of vo volume wise, you know, we spend an awful lot of money on insulin. Um, and if the if there's two products that cost the same, but one is a lot greener, then I think that's something at formulary level that we would want to know about. Um, you know, we, we are diabetes biased here uh, or even, um, you know, between you put the example of, you know, linagliptin, well, just knowing uh, price wise and being able to compare that I agree that's our job but I think that could be done at a, a kind of IMOC level. Um, I wrote down a couple of more uh, questions so you're doing this estimate and you showed that you know for Omeprazole and Resuvisatin it was quite close to the manufacturer's uh, analysis so out of these 2,000 plus products how many have got the actual manufacturer's life cycle analysis? How, how commonly is that done by manufacturers? Um, not commonly, especially not, especially not for generics. So I, I think there's this thing in pharmaceutical schools, they have like the um, ones that are done like a map. So this was from a AZ study and they have a lot of the market share, but not a lot of the actual prescriptions like these low cost generics is where this mm. information is actually very important and they I don't think there's any scope for those type of pharmaceutical manufacturers to do LCAs because they are mm. quite costly. I think yeah. the, the other issue with the LCAs is at the moment there's no standardized framework so two manufacturers could do an LCA on the same product and come to a different result and their conclusion would probably be oh we just did it in a different way. They wouldn't they wouldn't be able to fairly compare so whilst this is less accurate than an lca it's there's more scope for comparisons because you know that you're comparing it in the same way yeah okay because i was wondering if you know if if we take the step of as at a icb level say actually because this tablet here is green and prescribe this one than that one based on your website where the manufacturers would go hold on that's only an estimate that's not true we've got our own data kind of thing to show that we're greener and I don't know I, I, they, I don't, they might I, do that and I would say that's good because then it was also like adding visibility to that sort of thing so um, we are working closely with the manufacturers to sort of estimate for ones that don't have it their scope three or if they do have it then they could come to us and say look actually we have a better estimate because we've already done an LCA and we can show that it's more accurate I think at the moment it's still like very obtuse like a manufacturer could have done it but who knows where that information is yeah okay and then i'm just thinking out loud how does you make a make money what's your income revenue do you need you know different icbs or the nhs to sign up 
to this or? Uh, yes, so we have a sustainable medicine partnership, which is not for profit. Um, coalition of the willing, I think Anthony calls it, um, which we run and that's in year three or four. And that's like does projects. This was spun out from that as like one of the projects that we really focused on. And then this was funded specifically through the SBRI for the last year. Um, but yes, now in order to implement it into ICBs, we would be needing or looking at what funding that we can get to to do those sorts of things. Or like for the for example with the amoxicillin we did like the high level scientific research to sort of identify it as a hotspot but I don't think we'd like be delivering a product unless there was yeah some sort of funding in that area. Mm. Okay and um, can I ask the pharmacists on the group I wasn't aware of this amoxicillin story so so do you think that people on the ground are aware of this? Um, I think uh, certainly Phil Howard, who's one of the uh, 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 antibiotic leads across the country, has certainly been highlighting it um, clearly. I knew there was an issue, but I didn't quite know what that figure would be. And I can uh, a lot of the stuff that comes out we've been sending out is around just moving from uh, seven to five days, reducing costs, but I haven't actually been able to put a figure around what the carbon footprint reduction would be. And I think that would be really, really powerful. Just thinking back to the work that we've done on, on, on inhalers, the actual knowing that carbon mm. footprint reduction is really powerful and really helps drive change. So having that information in addition to the other information that we have, I think will be really beneficial. Great, thank you. OK, any other questions? OK, well, Hannah. Just a, just a quick comment. I've just done a little Google search and I don't think pharmaceutical companies do have to report. I think there's some lobbying going on around asking them to report their their carbon emissions for their processes, but I don't think they have to currently through legislation by the looks of it. No, they don't have to report. Any company that has a contract of more than five million with the NHS has to give their scope three emissions but not report on a specific product as of this year or it's being implemented and then from 2028 anyone who has a contract with the nhs would any company would have to give like an overall scope one two three emissions report yearly and that's sort of something where specifically for manufacturers we're trying to help them with the the scope three side of that as well so they can report on it but they don't have to give a specific product report no. okay Kavita. Yeah, just to add to that, um, so the social value model for NHS supply chain and procurement, uh, which came, um, I think it was the 1st of April 2022 that it went live in. Uh, now, that doesn't apply to medicine procurement. So all medicine procurement happens through the NHS, uh, happens through NHS England. But because, I mean, the, they, they say that there are just too many lines um, from that, I understand there are just too many products that we procure uh, for medicines. So it's just not possible to apply the social value model for medicine procurement. And therefore, it's only the evergreen assessment. And I believe, um, I think it's from the 1st of April, I'll have to, do, don't quote me on that. From a certain date, all medicines procurement, they've got to have, they've got to do the evergreen assessment. And it's a yes, no assessment. And if a particular supplier is not able to satisfy that question, then they basically can't bid for um, to be on the uh, framework with NHS England. Uh, so, yeah, I think procurement rules with medicines are slightly different. Thank you. Richard? Thank you, Jackie. Haroon, do you have, um, does you make us have a central contract with the NHS or are you funded by other means uh, for, you, for your own sustainability? Uh, no, we don't have a central contract with the NHS. We had the, we had the, the SPR grant funding for the last year to deliver this and then, yeah, our, um, and then also we run the Sustainable Medicines Partnership, which is where the like two income streams be. Okay, so I think um, 
you know, we need to have a think about what are the next steps. So um, if if you register, can I be cheeky? Is it free to register? Yeah, please do. OK. Hopefully uh, my, my computer's threatening to restart any moment, so apologies if I just, just suddenly come off this meeting. Um, and then, you know, I, I like Chris's idea of, you know, it could be integrated into different time ops, couldn't it? But it could also be integrated into formulary reviews. Potentially. Um, so it probably needs you know, some volunteers to spend a bit of time just, you know, just thinking about the next review that's coming up. Is it worth having a look at this and thinking of how it might be integrated or I don't know. Um, and certainly having, we... it, uh, certainly having it on the uh, new product request forms uh, as something to, to go and, and document what the carbon footprint comparisons are with the drugs that the drugs potentially going to be compared against is a certainly a, a starter. Yes. And that can be quite relatively easy implemented, I think. Yeah. OK, good. Um, and, and maybe, you know, just as a, if you could think about the last new product you had and just test it out and, you know, mm. here's, a, here's a demo of how you do it. This is how we want the information presented. I don't know. It wouldn't be a huge ask, Richard. I'm happy to pick up a conversation with Kavita outside this meeting, see how how we could take this forward in South Yorkshire for a starter. Mm, excellent. And I have a plea back to Haroon. What would it take then for you to do an in-depth analysis of diabetes medications as 10%, over 10% of the NHS budget is spent on diabetes. 80% of it is complications. Um, but, you know, there's still the drug bill. It's, it's still got to be at least 1% of the drug bill, if not more, uh, I would imagine, for the entire NHS. Um, yeah, that's a difficult question to answer. I'd have to speak to, <laughs> to Nadine and other people in Umica. I, I I mean, yeah, we're looking at different areas and where to use this next. I think it's very important. And I think like in terms of how you actually implement it into um, formaries, I've, we've seen with inhalers, like just the way that you implement, the way that you put it in there makes a big difference. Like some people have just like had a link at the top of their formary, but others have like actually put icons in for the inhalers. And that makes a big difference as to what people actually do on the ground. So it's very interesting to understand like where the next areas are. I know that doesn't really answer your question exactly, mm. but um, no. Yeah. And you know, we've discussed in the Halers as um, they have got the advantage that it was you know quaff and money attached, whereas yeah. what we're trying to do is a bit more hearts and minds uh, at the moment. But um, you know, Chris has been very good at getting it into his prescribing initiative, and it is something that I know we're working on in South Yorkshire as well. So just you know, the more illustrations around that. But I, I no doubt we could potentially just thinking about it. Um, we've all got net formularies, which is a, a web based uh, formulary. We could start thinking about having uh, in the same way we've done with inhalers is having specific uh, annotations uh, highlighting the level of carbon footprint on the medicines on the formulary site itself. Mm, mm. Uh, that could be quite a, something might be quite easily done uh, yeah. and it would help just highlight that. Yeah, I mean, it was interesting, the example you gave around dapagliflozin in that, you know, a lot of people will probably only need the five milligrams, but might be prescribed the 10, for instance. It's the same kind of thing as the amoxicillin. Kavitha? Um, so, as Richard said, we will pick up a conversation about how we can use this in South Yorkshire, but it's, I mean, I, I don't know if it's a question, but it's, it's just a thought I could have been. Uh, as Chris said, I think it would be a really good idea to uh, think about including this in the new new medicines applications. And I think it will have to be done because the formularies are different, aren't they? Because the ICB kind of, ha I suppose, have the influence um, to, you know, change things around the formulary that the GPs use in primary care, whereas the formulary for secondary care is completely different. 
So I suppose I'm I'm just thinking in terms of how we um, use this or how we socialize this. I think it might be would it be two different conversations. One will be led by the ICB medicines management, and the other, the chief pharmacists or the pharmacy teams within secondary care. There might be a bit of that, but actually a lot of it is no joint formery. So mm. I, I think it's a joint conversation. Ah, okay, that's helpful. Thank you, Chris. Excellent. Do we have Darren? I guess <laughs> to add to what Kavitha said, it's perhaps a conversation inside NHS England as well, because the, the pharmacy leads inside NHS England probably aren't aware of this piece of work either. So it's like um, some internal work that we would need to do. Mm. Right, thank you. So Haroon, uh, can I just check, are you happy if your emails uh, you know, are shared amongst the team in the minutes for people to contact you directly if, you know, if Darren wants a presentation to his team, for instance? Uh, yes, yeah, please do contact us for, for anything happy. Yeah, great, thank you. Okay, any other questions for Haroon before we let him go? Well, I want to say a huge thank you. Obviously, you know, very thought provoking and uh, we, we appreciate your time and carry on the good work. Thank you. Thanks. Lovely to meet you. Okay, bye bye. So, Diane, we have 10 minutes, but I think it is lots of updates, isn't it? And I do think that was really useful just to have a totally different slant of um, you know, what we could be doing and, and thinking about. So, thank you for inviting him. Shall I open the action log and should we see if yeah. we can whisk through that? Yes, yes, please. Um, so the first action, number two, I think we've got that on the agenda. Um, do you want to come back to that or do you want us no. to give you a bit of an update on that now? No, we just, we just need updates then because I'm sure most of us have got meetings starting at 10. No problem. Um, Claire, do you want to give a quick update on the educational presentations? Yeah, so basically they've been it's been done, it's been narrated and it's been sent round to some DSNs. I think Chris sent it on and I've had loads and loads of comments and some questions. So some of the questions we're going to need help answering. So I think perhaps me and um, Diane can email round some of the questions because they're things that um, about whether the uplift of the companies will allow um, for us to do this promotion work within the universities and also some points about when patients shouldn't be put on um, pens. So there's a few questions, but I think we're two time constraints to talk at this meeting. So if I do email the questions around with Diane, if, if we could get an answer, then we can record the final draft of it. But there's just been so many comments that it's basically it's going to have to get re-recorded, really, and a couple of new slides added as well. Yeah, but I think that's fine. I mean, the we, we have to push the companies. So they, you know, who knows where the supply chain issues are? I don't think even they know. But I think, you know, this isn't going to happen overnight. So I think we need to test the system and they will start to change their manufacturing. But it's not going to happen overnight. Um, because yeah, I, I mean, this, I is, this is what we, this is what I, I did say. I said it would be a drip, drip approach. But the DSNs are coming back asking these questions. And obviously. Well, that, but, but that's the answer. Mm. Please, please just start. The companies will start to change um you know slowly over time we've we've got to nearly 50 percent the companies aren't telling us to stop switching patients in sheffield because it's happened over a two-year process and you know hannah did speak to them they're not factoring it in because they don't think it's going to happen it's catch 22 we need to make a start the companies will respond and just reassure people yeah. So, I mean, I, the only thing is, I think that reassuring people would be to contact the companies and just say, we are doing this initiative. We are doing more education. You might see you might see that there may be um, some more changes and then we have communicated it. I think that's yeah, important that's right. as well. Mm. Yeah. Just while we're talking about education, just jumping ahead to number 16, um, 
Claire and I met with Sheffield, Hallam and York University um, because they um, expressed interest in having some educational material and supporting us with their student nurses. Um, so we have got another meeting with them, but they gave us some ideas of things that they'd like. And that was ideally an undergrad specific presentation. So we've started pulling that together. Um, it's just a variation really of Claire's, but a bit more aimed at um, undergrad. Um, so we'll, we'll share that round just for your OK as well. And one of, the other, one of the other things that was said, uh, Diane, was that about the PIP codes, about um, actually that like GPs and nurses don't tend to use PIP codes for prescribing and whether their chart and the for the non-medical prescribing could go without the PIP codes. I've, I've never used a PIP code in my life, so it, it, to me, and I were a nurse prescriber, so I just sort of think I don't know where PIP codes fit in. Um, the pharmacies obviously do, but for us, um, so is that OK or, or do they need to be there for a reason, the PIP codes? I'll let the pharmacist answer that because I never use PIP codes either. <laughs> yeah, I asked a GP friend of mine because I was like, oh, maybe I'm being sick, but I've never used a PIP code to prescribe ever. So hence, I just couldn't work out why we were using a bit of space on this chart with PIP codes and, and the undergraduate nurse. Um, lecturer sort of said the same thing so I just wondered why we were including them in the charts. Oh good take it out you've got the information if somebody emails you and wants the PIP codes you just could just send off the slide so you know just keep a version of it but take the PIP yeah. codes out. Okay. Great. I think Diane you'll have to contact Michelle separately so uh, let's let's move on. Yep I've got a reply from her right. actually and okay. I think um let me um, see if I can just find it. Yeah. Um, so regarding the prescribe, prescribing incentive schemes, the national team are aware of any areas that are incentivised in the move. Uh, the reply was not currently, but a few people have raised this recently, so it could be an interesting area to explore more. But we don't have any data to compare the impact of reusable ones versus disposable. So I'll send her our slides because we've obviously yeah. got some data now for our area. Um, are you aware of any greener initiatives for cartridge disposable? And they were only aware of PenCycle, which was the same as us. Mm. And then regarding the green waste management, what plans are there nationally on clinical waste disposal? Um, um, I'll let you read that because it's quite a lot of detail. Nothing to action. No, nothing to action, just an update. So we can probably close those actions down because I don't think um, they've helped us particularly, but at least we know now the answer to those questions. Um, so we've had you makers today, so we can close that down. We've covered that one. That's done, that can be closed about calculating the cost. Um, we, so last time we, um, Hawarin asked us if we could do some slides to go along to the NHS Greener Regional Steering Group and also a post off for the NEY Productivity and Efficiency Working Group. Kavitha, do you want to give an update on, on how that went at the NHS Greener Steering Group? Or Darren, either? <laughs> um, well, I'll, I'll start and kind of Kavitha can, can add her own view. Um, it went down really well. <coughs> Our <coughs> direct line management for the Greener team is uh, Caroline Wood, who's uh, a finance uh, and accounting by background. Um, and her preference, is, or part of her preference for us working um, across programmes is to demonstrate to ICBs the value of, of programmes that happen to be greener. So this is a really good a, a way of demonstrating from your presentation better healthcare um, that supports patients, but actually it's greener by default. Um, so um, that's then been shared with ICB chief executives as well as, a, as an example. Uh, but it's just one of several things that we would be kind of moving to, to share. But the, the presentation itself went down really well. Thanks, uh, Diane. Um, and it's a, a real practical example that people can understand rather than us just talking about carbon and carbon footprints very much uh, in uh, the area that we want to work in. Uh, Kavitha? I've got nothing to add, Darren. 
Thank you. Okay. You've covered everything. Thanks. So can I ask you two then, what do you think we can do more to push this further and keep it, you know, on that agenda? So, Darren, are you happy for me to just update what I'm planning to do? So um, so we are currently working on 24-25 priorities, uh, Jackie, for medicines, and that's across the uh, regional footprint. I mean, Chris is part of the group, and we've now got representation from secondary care as well. We've got one pharmacist, chief pharmacist from York, representing Yorkshire and Humber, and we've got a couple of pharmacists representing Northeast and North Cumbria. Um, so this will be the first time we'll have some secondary care representation in our meetings. So this is definitely up there as one of our priorities for 24-25. And I will be exploring with the medicines ma management um, pharmacies how we can take this forward and use the example that Chris has within Yorkshire and uh, I'm sorry, Humber and North Yorks. And I'm picking up a separate conversation with Richard as well in terms of how we want to take it forward within South Yorkshire. So, yeah, it's because of the two hats that I wear. I'm going to look at, look at it from a regional perspective. But then within South Yorkshire as well, I want to see how we can do it. Is that does that answer your question, Jackie? No, no, that that's great. And, and then that... kind of in, initial thoughts have been um, obviously there is the shortage, and Chris sent that um, mm. email to all of us, didn't he? So there is the shortage, so it's probably going to happen anyway. But I think the the work for us is right. How do we make use of this? If I can call it a crisis, uh, you know, the supply situation basically. And how do we sustain that chain beyond the supply uh, issue? Uh, that's what I'm keen on exploring uh, with everyone. Mm. Great, thank you. And and we'd obviously also do it with the, the other two ICBs as well, and it, it, in different ways. Uh, and we have shared it with the um, NHS England primary care team as well, <coughs> as, as a way of get, generating their interest both in our agenda but obviously specifically in this agenda as well great okay thank you so sorry, is, could I, no, sorry jackie could i just come in uh darren if this is being i know it was more kind of uh, awareness creation with the primary care team but just so that people don't go off and work um in two parallel work streams, just so that there is no duplication. If primary care team uh, is indeed looking at picking this up, it would be really good to kind of work together on this rather than having two different sets of people looking at it. Oh, definitely. Um, and we kind of said that this is a, um, kind of used it as an example using Diane's slides with the primary care team. So we kind of aim them back towards the work that you're doing Diane rather than us saying we're kind of starting something new it was a way of kind of talking to them about something that was was real um, interestingly I've had no feedback from the, the day I spent with the primary care team so I might be bigging up a little bit too much at the minute but we'll be going back to them to uh, ask them what they're going to do with all the information we gave them mm. Yeah, and obviously if they want the slides amending, then, you know, we're happy to do that. And we've got we've got all the information. It's just it might need just chunking down in different ways for different audiences. Well done to Diane and Claire for pulling the slides together. OK, the last action was just regarding um, ICBs. We're going to go and just see if the pharmaceutical reps could get um, example pens. And that was something else that came out of the meeting with the universities that Claire and I had, that they'd also like those demonstration pens, but not just the reusable, but all of them really, just mm. so that they can use them in simulation. Um, so I just wondered how how um, you were getting on with that. So me and Richard are going to meet. We've got a meeting set up. Things have got really busy where I work. Like So unfortunately, things are, are a bit slow. So we, me and Richard are going to meet with my boss and talk it through. And then we've I have also spoken to Novo Rep um, and they didn't seem like they would be keen to give um, massive amounts of pens. Um, but if people came to training, they may consider that. So they were a little bit of, um, it, I didn't speak to somebody very high up in, it was one of the Novo reps, but they didn't seem very um, sort of 
it like a blanket or yes we could supply lots and lots of pens and they also said for dem thing, the demonstration cartridges they couldn't supply demonstration cartridges in enough volume at the moment because the shortages were so great so um so then that was the initial conversation with the Novo rep but me and Richard and my boss Helen because the very um at the CCG at the ICB sorry the very um in Sheffield place drug companies the relationship with them they, they're very cautious and therefore my boss is going to attend that meeting um Helen so is that is that all? so Helen's going to meet with Richard and and get involved in looking at that then the feedback from the practice nurses when I sent out was yes we haven't got anything to show patients yes please give them give them to us so even if even if we can't get the drug companies to supply us with enough pens I think that we need to empower the nurses to know where to contact the drug companies to get the pens so they can then at least have some sample pens because if you are showing somebody insulin you need a sample pen so I don't think it's going to be plain sailing and, and my boss used to be a, a drug rep and she said that she she cannot see them because the it, giving samples is a way in to a GP surgery so her view was that she can't see that they would just blanket give us them that then we distribute so um but I think we're going to me and Richard are going to meet with my boss mm. and, and meet with them and see but it is so going it to be might, slower yeah, it might be yeah. more than educating the practices the nurses of, of who they need to contact to get their own samples then rather than you organize the samples on their behalf and that works as long as they get the pens you know they need to be able to use the pens and be able to show the patient the pen don't they yeah so the, result, the resources the that, we were, that we were going to make was Jackie's chart on one side and on the other chart the name of the three different pens how long they lasted and where they could get them from and I think that that might be a really good start and um, so that okay but we'll, but we'll come back to you yeah great two really quick comments then one from Richard one from Chris and then we do need to close I reached out to Lily and um, um, Ian, our local rep. Uh, we did have an initial discussion and then basically the crux of it, I think similar to Novo, there will be an issue getting the volume uh, distributed to us. But I do feel like um, Claire was saying that the best way forward would be for the individual practices to contact the reps directly to put yeah, that pressure good. on as well. Great. OK. And Chris? Just a quick one around the education, just to, uh, something that came up the other day was around consideration around care homes and uh, social care and the training that they need because they have some concerns moving to reusable pens where they can't easily identify what their insulin is actually in the pen. So we just need to think about that. Yeah, and I, I do think that's a separate issue, but it's also quite small volume compared to yeah. the overall yeah. issue. So, you know, it's kind of minutiae further yeah. down. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you very much, everybody. It's really good progress. I was going to suggest that we perhaps leave next meeting perhaps for another three months and then Chris come back with some prescribing data um, because we have nothing really urgent at the minute because we were trying to get to this point where we had, you know, all the materials to share. And Claire, you can, you know, send around the questions by email. We can do that by email and progress that, can't we? Yeah. Um, and then that's it. Just have a catch up in three months' time and see where we've had and see you know what impact the initiatives yeah. is, is having. Would you be interested at the next meeting if we had somebody come along and talk about another initiative mm. of recycling tech? Mm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay. Excellent. Okay, thank you very um, much, everyone. Thank Take you. care. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.